into the smoky morning And I'm trudging down the line Past the dirty, tanky engine Going to the mine Rows of pit folks' houses Like regiments in time Taste the gritty daylight When you're going to the mine Whistle of the buzzer And it's time to rise and shine How I long for thunder When I'm going to the mine Falling snow around us And it's turning into grime Down the coaly trackway When you're going to the mine Flying birds and freedom But I must serve me time One day I mean, I suppose I was pretty much born to be a miner because uh, both my grandfathers were, were miners. They both worked in this area, which they both had quite uh, quite large families. Uh, and pretty much 90% uh, of the sons from them two families, they all worked in the quarry. Every one of the family, my grandfather, my uncles and my brother, they were all in the mines. My grandfather and my father was down the pit. My grandfather and my mother said was a miner all his life apart from being in two world wars. My father went to the pit. All my grandparents, great-grandparents, uh, great-great-grandparents uh, are mining stock. My father was a miner. My mother's three brothers were, were miners. My two grandfathers were miners. My father worked at the pit for 49 years. His father worked at the pit for, I think it was 20 years plus. My father was a miner. My uh, grandfather was father, his father before him and his father before him. We're all in the mines. Past the dirty, tanky engine, going to the mine. I worked for the National Coal Board from 1952 uh, until 1965. He left school and went to the pit as a, a, a little alley, 14 year old, and these kids were there working a bank that's on the surface, uh, sending props down the pit or working on the screens, picking stones out. And uh, the first job he gave me was stand here with a pail of water and a piece of sacking tied onto a pick shaft. And on a, a turn where the tubs came out of the pit to go around this turn, they were sticking. Just keep lashing a bit of water on there. And I stood there like a wazzik doing this. I thought... What am I doing here? I'm class one army vehicle mechanic. They told me if I sign on, you'll be a sergeant. Six months training prior to uh, starting at my own quarry, which was Weymouth. And when I first got in the cage and went down, it was a training gallery, but it was underground in coal, in coal face workings. And uh, it wasn't a very nice environment. And I think that stayed with us for the rest of my life in the pit. They sent me over the screen one day, and these poor kids, the noise, the calls went down, and they called the shaker, shaker. Ah, ah, ah. There was conveyors when the kids were pulling us off, and the dust was, and there was windows were all smashed, the wind was blown through. And after about an hour of that, the noise, I thought, if he sacks me, he can sack me. I can remember the first day when I went to work on the screens, eight hours, eight and a half hours actually then, and you couldn't see, you could hardly see in front of you because of the dust. Uh, and the noise in the screens was absolutely horrendous. And I remember getting home, and uh, my mother had me tea on the table for us when I got home. And I remember thinking, I wish I was 65. That was an absolute hell of a day. I think it conditioned my thinking in the minds for me, the rest of my life. When we first went down, we were out just brand new apprenticeships. We had a brand new boots on and uh, brand new overalls and lovely white helmets. And they put all the cage together and away we went. And it was just like a big, it was like being on the shoes, I suppose. And wow, this is wonderful. But when, when I come, come time to get back to service, the, uh, that was the main shift in. And, and most of the lads got the main cage. But well, there was two or three, was, uh, uh, there was enough in the case, so two or three was had to ride up back with the main that was coming off, off shift. And the, the main thing I had was the smell. I couldn't believe the smell of them men. They were absolutely stinking. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to work in this, and I couldn't believe the smell of sweat. And, the, and 
The funny thing is, I've never actually smelt that after that first time. And there was a smell that assailed your nostrils, and it's a mixture of pony dung, tobacco juice, and male sweat, and decaying timber. Those are the prominent things that hit you. And according to how far you were in, one got stronger or weaker. The first time I went coal filling, which was filling coal all day with a shovel, I remember going home. I was married at the time. I was only young. I was about 20. I was married. I went in the house. I couldn't eat me dinner. I went to bed, and I didn't get up until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And my hands and every bone and muscle in my body was aching. And I had to go back the next day and day it again. It was really hard work. Robert the bank, me canny lad, wind her away, keep turning. The back ship men are coming yen, they'll be back in the morning. Me father used to call the tone when the long shift it was over, and coming by you'd hear him cry, you know. After four, he cried, Rob the bank, me canny lad, wind her away, keep turning. The onset of rings the bell in the bottom of the shaft, which registers in the winding house, uh, and that's the guy that does the rapid, the rapid, he raps the bell to tell the winding engine to, to send the cage back up. When it went down, it's a bit frightening because it drops you down, you know, at decent speed, you know, and it's, it gets, it's dark, you see. And it's uh, and you have your lamp on, you know your cap lamp, and it's um, yeah, it's 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 different. This old lad, he's taken bad. He'll be back here never. This cage is a is a twin deck, but sometimes you have three decks. When you got into the into that lower deck and you were you were crouched in a in a very difficult position with the, your bait, your bottles of water, your tools, what have you. And then someone broke wind. It was very bloody uncomfortable. One to stop, two to go. Three for the men on. They were the signals. So if you hear pitmen say wrap around, the main stop. And if they want to go, they say wrap her away. When you go down, the first thing you think of, the first time I went down, was the cage was very small. I'd seen the cages at Dudley and they were quite large, but at the training, they were just a little bit bigger than the tub, so you couldn't stand up in the cage. So already you were crouching. So the feeling was, if it's as high as this in the cage, what is it, what's it going to be like underground? But of course, underground, you've got to travel quite a way to the cold face, so they're not so cruel that they make you travel stooped all the way, except the coal owners who were penny pinching. So the feeling initially is you're crammed in a cage, you're going down, and it's a bit like a lift, only a bit faster. And as you get in the cage, there's a clang of the gates, and you've got this feeling it's too late if you've got any panic. But Everybody would did it. It was happening every day. All the other lads in the village did it, so that was normal. So you were dropping and dropping and dropping, and you feel the air rushing past. And also, you passed tunnels that were lit as you went down the shaft, because there wasn't just one tunnel at the bottom. There was tunnels which entered the shaft halfway up. So you passed those, and you realised as you were getting deeper and deeper, you were going down to the bottom. You've got to watch watch uh, where you're walking uh, your head uh, it's often height changes so you may be walking in a roadway what's six foot high and then because of convergence of the stone essentially crush, crushing the steelwork it's hot dusty very very dark the mulligans is the the main fit the main roadway into the coal face that's where the coal comes out from the other extreme is the tailgate which is the other end of a coal face, in which the majority of the supplies went in because the supplies for the face would be sent down the conveyor. 
used to go down the pit and walk in by and when they got in by they would always stop because it was a canny walk and we sort of a mile and a half or so and when you got to the kist that was where you, you met them the crack was great what had happened at the club at the weekend it was like going to pitches the report to the kist that was like the devil's office you know he had a he had, he had a he was like a bench there and he kept his report books and whatnot. And uh, he used to take the names down and what you were, you see. And there was some fitters and electricians here and he says, uh, he says, Well, you're yeah, all fitters for the day. He says, I can't spell electrician. <laughs> you would have a uh, shot firer. Uh, he, would, he would be responsible for the explosives, basically. Uh, and he, he would often stand in for a deputy. I think they, they had very similar qualifications. Uh, then above the deputies, you would have the overman. Uh, above him, an under manager, uh, shift under manager, uh, shift manager. Uh, and right at the very top was a colliery manager uh, who was responsible for the Mines and Quarries Act, basically. They used to put corrugated iron sheets between this, the arch girders. And this one couldn't spell corrugated iron, so he put wiggly tin on the report. I mean, you know, when these reports would go to the manager or the government inspector, they must have, had a, they must have laughed, you know. I was a, fan, a fanatic for TV football, uh, watching the football. And I asked this lad, this other shot fighter, would he change his shifts? from two in the afternoon to six in the morning so I could see the football match. He turned this down. No, Bill, you're not going to have it. So I, I came to work that day, this concert, didn't see the match. So at the end of my shift, uh, we all used to fill short fire record books in how many shots you fired. And it was England playing Wales. That was a football match. When I opened the book up, Jack Cook had put in, while Bill was firing down the mine, England's team was doing fine. But by the time he fired out, Wales had won power one out. <laughs> Cabling system went on for about three months, and then that, the names went in the hat again, and you were transferred all over the pitch. All depends how you, where your name come out. You were paid by the orange and uh, they, they, were, they, they had the, they called it Peace Walk. It wasn't called Burnley Square, it was called Peace Walk. Uh, basically the more cool you cut, the more cool you mine, the more money you got. Uh, mining being mining in different conditions, one face, uh, face next door maybe a different condition, maybe harder work. Hence the cable and where they would drive for a cable, so every three months you got a different cable. You rub the cables, the deputy would write on the back of this plank, one five three six two four or whatever you know, and then the other side he would put mark on, and you could rub the one you wanted. The first one wouldn't be a very good one, and the last one definitely wasn't a good one, because the end of the conveyor was there, and you couldn't shovel coal on, so you had to what you call cast the coal twice. The conditions might be good, or the conditions might be uh, terrible, and if the conditions was terrible, you didn't make much money. You know, and if you got a good uh, a good cable, you were making yeah, you were making good money. I always remember my grandfather told the tale that uh, nineteen thirty nine they had getting a cable at Woodown Colliery, where they were getting five pound a week, and five pound a week in nineteen thirty nine was big money. And uh, Hitland Neville Chamberlain uh, <laughs> the, the, they brought the cable up because the war started, and he got called into the Royal Navy. You know, and he went from five pound a week to two pound a day. <laughs> but the idea started like before that, when people worked it with picks, going in places. You could get some places where they would be working pretty high coal them days. Uh, if you got a place where there was real pressure on, the pressure would knock the coal out for you, you know, and it was easy gun. And you get somewhere it was like bell metal. There was a, a deputy we had who was always oh, he was dead interested in cars. It was always so when he come in with me trained as a mechanic, uh used to the crack about cars, you know. But I noticed that when he put the rubs in, if there was six in he would put he would always put one five three six two four, which as a mechanic, you know, 
That's the firing order of a six-cylinder engine on 5.36.24. So I noticed when he t first time he turned it over, the things rung a bell with us. So I could always provide, I could guess which one was won. <laughs> so you could always uh, have a good uh, have a good rope to see. It's doing the job on a Monday morning. Kevin is the best. And the most he's seen with the Thompson's team in a flat cow, the 14 Quest. The base is 105 yards back when measured from yuck to yuck. And while Carl and all the Scoblins lads keep doing all you're going to get stuck. Oh, the Collier lad, he's a caddy lad. And he's always on. The Collier Lad was a song about a coal face. It's doing the shaft on a Monday morning, the cable is the best. The roof was canny, there was day water on the bottom, and probably it was even as high as three foot. Three foot seam, you can kneel comfortably, you can swing your shovel, so the cable's the best. The team would be a team of people, men, who shovel the coal onto the conveyor. And the scufflings are the loose pieces of coal that the coal cutters left. So if there's any scufflings left, you've got to crawl out of them. The conveyors going along the coal face, their job is shovel the coal onto the belt where there's a hole where the coal's been, put a prop in, or put a set of gears. It might be a piece of coal and a piece of stone joined together, drop on. So you say, hide it on, didn't care. And if you high enough stone on, the conveyor belt won't take it because it's used to light material like coal. So gradually the rubber stretches and stretches and eventually the, the little grips that hold the bits together, like that, with a pin in between the wood. Boing! And then all hell breaks loose. Because if the coal's not coming off, it's the end of the world in the curry. So the deputy comes and throws his stick down and, and he's hot on the ground and dances with rage. The cutter was like a chainsaw but a big one and it cut underneath the coal seam, cut four foot under the coal seam and uh, cut about four or five inches out, drill and drill the holes in the coal, shot fire put shots in, fired it down and the fillers shovel it on and put supports in. Sometimes when the coal cut has been to cut a little bit out of the seam at the bottom, so when the coal is blasted, it's got a space to blast into, the coal falls evenly and then it's easy. It walks on the shoulders, actually. A canch is the stone that's left above the coal seam. The coal might have been two foot six to a wee yard high, three foot high, and there was the roadway, the roadway of the main gate, the tailgate, might have been seven or eight foot high, so you had that stone, all the stone, you see. So they took the stone, they filled the stone away, and stowed some of the stone and filled it away. The canch work was hard, because, I mean, when I was on the back canch at uh, Eppelham, we were on about two or three faces, everything was shoveling, hard shoveling. There was four of us on it, and you used to have to drill it, fire it, and then put the, uh, the crown up, the girder, and then shovel the wood shot away. Put the pans or stout, the stout part in there. That was, that was hard work. When you're going forward with your tunnels, there's a piece of rock like that is taken down. Now some of it's used to provide a, what they call a dry stone wall. What the canch is the top bit, and that comes down. But not all of it. Some, sometimes you get tubs of stone going out by. And that's why sometimes the heap gets a bit higher. At the end of every shift, on a stone shift, that canch gets dropped down and stored in the gulf. When the machine comes down, the fierce, it cuts the coal, and the lads behind the machine shove the conveyor over, and the other two lads draw the supports in. The gulf is the stone what's left behind which is waste and it just comes down with it, sometimes with a terrible crash. You've always got to watch for the roof bumping on. That means that the shale above the seam, uh, where the coal's been taken out, perhaps above a tunnel, is beginning to crack. 
Somebody might have been in already before you and putting in props, sets of gears, extra supports. Put two or three guards up a shift. You know, 15 by 10s, like 15 feet um, wide by 10 foot high. You just have to cut it out and then we have to put the guard up, put the crown up, put the legs on and timber it up. You might get hopped up if a piece comes out. And that means it could be a piece that size, which just rules you, or a piece that size that might knock a bit sense at you, or a piece this size that would cause quite a lot of damage and prevent you from working. There was one face I was on at that and it was called Q10 here. I can still remember it. And uh, it went for about 200 yards and it was post, top was post. Some people might call it Sandston. I'd just gone off the face and it came in a wanna. A whole lot come down. I don't know if it blew the airlock doors off by 200 yards over here because it changed the wind. Now, a catranos is a fossilised tree stump which in the roof of the seam and usually where the coal is and it joins the roof, it forms a slick inside. That's a glassy surface where the bark is fossilised of the stump. So as well as boating on, you've got to keep an eye when you're on a cold face for anything that looks like a cat and arse. Everybody will see that might be a cat and arse. We're just getting all of the stone. It was poor stone and all. I, was, I says, John, get down. We're standing, like, turning the guard around. You go down, there's a stone come down. It's about as big as that dining room. About a yard thick. I just come down the water. It was too big to break up with a melon, man. So I had to drill and fire it in the conveyor to the way. And the jowling is actually with his pick handle, he would hit the, the roof like that. Hit the sides, and he would be listening for loose sounds. And if there's any loose stone, he would try and get that away before he started to work. If you think the roof's at all slack, if you drown it, you can sharp tell whether there's a, a, an area above the major band of shale that is the, the gap, because it echoes. Like tapping bread, you know, when, when you get bread out of the oven, is it done? It should sound hollow. So you can get the end of your pick handle, IML, and just go like that, and you can tell. And you can even, you can even hear it moving when you do that. And when you're crawling along the face and you stop, if you can hear it creaking like that, you've got to work out how dangerous it is. We were loading the slush, uh, slusher to stuck stow the gulf because the canch had getting behind and there were about f four cuts behind of the canch. And uh, me and my mate had come off the face and they stopped the hauler to get us off. And just as he, as we got off, there was a guy had to sit under the under the stone, and he was waving to a guy in the gulf with a slump yeah. in that area, wanting to stop. Yeah. That way, yeah. To, that way to go, yeah. that way to stop. Yeah. And uh, he, he tightened the hauler on to take another bucket full in, and the rope got struck, and this guy on the face waved to stop. But this, by the time they got the message, it was too late, oh. and it drew all the, oh. fast, it drew all the props out, and a whole lot of the stone fell on top of this yeah. guy. Down in the mine, obviously, uh, you're in the darkness except for your cap lamp. Uh, and if, it, if you're sitting in close quarters, that would be on uh, dipped beam, for want of a better word, but it just allows you to talk to someone without shining the light in your eyes. Uh, so, it, it, as long as you're within hearing range, you just communicate as normal, but often the guy who's working with you can be two or three hundred yards away, you know, and all you can see of him is, is, is his light. Uh, and your means of communicating then is, it, you know, waving your light horizontally or vertically, just to ask him to do something. And then you trust him that he understands what you've asked him to do, and he does it. Because if he gets it wrong, you know, you could be seriously hurt.
So I had a very bad accident in 1963 uh, on a cold cutting machine, uh, which was a Japan shearer, which had a disc in the front and a big disc at the back. And uh, I was having to be changing picks on the back disc when somebody wanted to touch for changing them on the front and I went over the top. And fortunately for me, the roof was away. And uh, well, I had the pick, big pick half out with a key and it stole the machine. Otherwise, I could have been worse off. I had the uh, me, me whole hand here was degloved. I had a big pick through my left arm and I had a pick through here. In all my time in the mining industry, I, I only witnessed one fatal accident. And unfortunately, that was a friend of mine. There was a, an underground shaft connecting two seams. Imagine one seam higher than the other. And to make a central loading point so that all the coals that go out of the mines are one point instead of from two points. They drove a shaft down and up and met in the middle. And the coal and the stone went down the shaft to the bottom to be loaded into tubs to be taken out by to the shaft and then to the service. And it became blocked one day. And the engineer he went in to try and free the blockage. And there was a fall of coal from above and he was buried. Um, it was my unfortunate task to get him out. I gave him the kiss of life. Um, underground, on the train, in the cage, on the service, in the ambulance, into the operating theatre. But there was no way he died. The train, obviously, he says to me, grab this. And it was a stretcher. And I was taken up at the end of this board, and there was the ambulance train with the dead man on. And I loaded them onto the, onto the stretcher and I carried him out the pit. How old were you? 15, just turned 15. <laughs> there was a lad called Ishmael Jowett, where I named that, eh? Ishmael. He was killed with a cutter, with a shoving the cutter around and he got his foot on the picks and it dragged him in and hacked his leg off. The worst one I ever saw was uh, electrician where his fingers took off a dab on him and we had to carry him out. I tell you, someone carrying a 14 stone lad out of, out of a pit is, is hard work. In fact, I had a bad back for about two weeks after it. Billy was the one that stood it. He's telling me that, um, he says, when I said that I've applied to go on the deputy scores, he says, but board, he says, I used to be a deputy. I says, did you? I, I had Trimden Grange. He says, uh, I says, wait. Well, you know, deputy, that why, why he says, I went to fire one day, and he says, I, I, I stem the holes, and you always have to test for gas before you fire. So he said, I, I test for gas, and he said, I says, I, I can't fire, the, 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 there's gas. They says, why waff it away with your coat like the others do? So he says, what? He says, well, get, get your coat, waffs the gas away, tests again, no gas, right, 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 right. No, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, tools, the bookmen's coming in, they want to be on the face. All oh, right. So he says, these come in, got the coats off, and they go, wait a minute, I want to bite a bit before we go a bit. So anyway, he says, right, now we're, and so, there, 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 there's, there's fire. And he says, ah, ah, ah. I look round what my body says, and I've a big b -b -b ball of fire come r rolling down the gate. He says, and blow me. Between two sets of doors, and I walk up with me clothes on fire. And he says, uh, "Them days they didn't tuck it hospital." He says, oh, "How's it, yem? Wrapped up like a mummy." He says, "Ah, ha, 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 la, ha, la, had was a hole for a tab." <laughs> Somebody actually get one of these mannequins, get the mannequins head, and they hung, they hung it from a roof. But what what they did, they used to get the air doors. But the air doors would, uh, uh, I'm not sure if the people understand, but you had like an intake and a, and, a, and a return. And to keep them apart, you had what the air doors. 
and they were quite hard to get through and because you had like from a pressure drop. So uh, if you were going from intake to the return, you would have to go through these uh, these air doors. And what one of the one of the wags were doing this 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 time, he decided because he knew these these air doors were quite heavy and he had to shove them. When he went when he when he shoved your head, actually went doing like that to get them through. And as he walked through, you lifted your head up. And he hung this mannequin's head from the from the girl on the rip. So when he come up, the first thing he seen was his head swinging, and he thought that's some poor boy had hung last The course came along a belt, loaded onto a trunk belt, which in turn loaded into tubs. And these tubs were then clipped onto anuses and were sent out by. You were paid by the tokens. If you were a putter, put them out, you put your token on the outside of the tub, and the more that went out, the more you got paid. Fullens was the full ones and the chubbins was the empties. Fullens went out and the chubbins come in. Aye, and hanging on and knocking off with the ham boons on the haulage. The ham boon was on a, um, a chain, and the chain, a chain coupled on the tub, and then the ham boon hung on the rope, and it pulled a, the, it was a, a endless rope haulage. And uh, endless rope haulage is run for, oh, run for a long way. You know, it may run for a mile. When this rope got to the end, to where the shaft was, there would be a guy with a, a wooden pl uh, chock, and he'd hit that, which released the clamp. He would take the clamp off, and then the tubs would be free run, and he would have wood dregs, and he would catch up with the wheels and put them in various, which slowed the tubs up. And the main and tail ropes is flying away, because the main and tail go at a canny speed. That's a rope on the back and a rope on the front, and a set of maybe 20 tubs. They go much faster than an endless rope. You know, they go 10 miles an hour or more, which is quite a speed underground. And then they come off, and you're walking. The, 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 what we call a set's gone to main. It's gone out, you know, see the set's gone to main. You've got to jump out the way, and that's why that manhole's all the way along. Tubes, they, 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 they run away, you know, they, they, they start to run away, they go that speed. And they used to shout, set them in, set them in. You know, and people used to, get, used to run the manhole. Putters were the ones that, you know, when you say you put the shot, or you put the tubs, it was shoving tubs about. Uh, you could either shove them, hand putters, or you could be gallop putters. Uh, that was, you had a pony, and you were... Uh, took the tubs in and out with the pony. We didn't have ponies to pull the tubs. It was hand putting. And it was difficult, hard, damn work. No, the deputy in the main call flat last Saturday morning said, all the war putters has dropped off work. Where he's going to put instead? Where your anxious look come out of the fierce of all the call you was there? Eagerly they looked to say, wait volunteer to put that day. And a hard man staggered down the gate. His hoggers was old and worn. How strange our Andrew felt on the limbers that Saturday morn. And as his bare legs scraped the clots, we never a single pause. The language what come after was the worst I've ever heard. The same was one I'll never forget As long as I might live And just to say it I would regret Miss Lush Cap I would give The drivers there was all amazed The deputy holding grey There's none of them would ever forget That shift last Saturday No what Andrew says when the shift was done He'd never put name there why the deputy says there's general rate, why lad this put three score. Ah, Andrew says thou cannot kid me, and I were I feel like. And if thou wants a putter again, they can send him for thee wife. And as he dragged his pick and shut a little, 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 along the clot he got in board. The language what come after was the worst I've ever heard. The saying was one I'll never forget, long as I might live. And just to say it, I would give me slush cap, I would give. The drivers there was all amazed, the deputy old and grey. There's none of them would ever forget that shift last Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> You've got arse on a tub. To protect your back, get hold of the tub like this. You get 
your back against it, you just lift it up and move it across and drop it in. And that's what you say at our son. On, on, on the first you all walk as a team, you pull it in together and it's quite often if a lad wanted a hand, we would give them a hand or, or vice versa. Well, there's a big trust thing between miners. Uh, you're relying on one another. Uh, I, I, I've never served in the army, but I, I think it must be a lot like, you know, like lads who've served in the trenches together. You know, you build up an understanding. You, you've gone through the same, the same things, the same hardships. Uh, you know, and, and miners from wherever in the world, uh, there's a natural understanding. You know, if you talk to another miner from anywhere in the world, and you say you're a coal miner, you know, you might be a coal miner from Poland. He knows exactly what you've gone through. What, what you've done. Conditions were very, very hard. Um, seems very low, often wet. Um, we often lay in three inches of cold water, filling coal in a seam which was only 20 inches high. Uh, the thinnest seam was at Saracen, was only 12 inches thick. The coal cutter cut six inches of stone out underneath that, and that gave 18 inches of height. You're on your knees all the time, you're nailing water all the time, you know. You know, when you work at a building site, if it starts to rain, the lads go in the cabin, cave dry, fair enough. We couldn't. It was just raining all the way. It, you, we had these um, <coughs> plastic things what they used to wear away. They used to make you sweat. And, they didn't really keep the water out after after we'd been in a couple of hours. And Charlie was always on about getting these suits. Off. I remember him being on to the under manager about Viking, I think they called them Viking suits. We never got them. We used to come off there drowned it. It was their job to get as much work out of us for as little as possible, you know. Uh, even to the point where you could be crawling in water soaking wet all day and you finish up arguing about whether the water came from the roof or... Because it came from the roof, you get one pound fifty a day, right? But if, it, if it's just floor water, it's groundwater, it's 26 pence a day. So, so you, you would be arguing about the difference. But the thing is, if, if, you're, working on a, if you're working on a coal face 30 inches high, you know, and the, the six or seven, eight inches of water, it, it doesn't really make any difference where it comes from. If you're walking in a wet stream, you've got uh, water coming from the top, from the roof, and it wasn't very nice, and it was always carved water, and obviously if you got wet. So some faces you've got a little bit extra payment. So I remember when faces were in there, it, was, it wasn't just wet money, it was a really, uh, there was a lot of faults in this face, and you were cutting it, it was a rain, it's the dust when the lads was cutting, and even with masks in here, it was like, if you imagine, a very thick uh, pig super. Of, uh, like folk, and that was just the dust in here. I used to stand my overalls up after I took them off. They were wet and they were caked with mud, which was coal dust and stone dust. And the next morning, they would be standing in the corner, and I used to dad them off the wall, hit them off the wall, to get all the muck off, and then put them on, and then go down and get wet again. Very, very dusty, extremely dusty, hot, uh, unbelievably hot. Uh, sweat just thinking about it, uh, really, really noisy. Uh, something that's not often picked up on camera shots or stills uh, is the noise at the time of fans and jigger picks working and machinery working and tub wheels squealing and uh, conveyors running. Um, it's a really, really noisy, dusty and hot, although some pits are extremely cold as well. I was at one pit and they had these chemical toilets, but I, uh, nobody really used them, I didn't think. <laughs> Put it this way, he never picked a flat stone up in the tailgate. <laughs> Don't pick up flat stones or anti answer telephones. Uh, one's going to get your fingers very dirty and the other one's going to get you a job. They, they, they put these chemical toilets in. And they were horrible, bloody horrible. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of them, little, little flies. I'm not going to use the word, but they were horrible little beasts, you know, and they were absolutely heaving with them. I had just a bait bag. And it was just wrapped, it was a little sack what was made with a drawstring and tied at the top, and greaseproof paper on your sandwiches. But when you opened them up, Ray, there they were, these little fellas, just fleeing with your sandwiches. But you were so bloody hungry, you ate. The worst thing about, about bait was if you had mice down the pit, you would have to suspend your bait on shot wire. Shot wire is the, the cable uh, which is uh, run out and connects the explosives together in the heading. Uh, so you would suspend it from a girder down and just suspend your bait bag there to stop the mice getting it. Yeah. You had the tilly, the tuny, the five quarter, six quarter, yard seam, and the brockwell. These were all seams. There was a Bencham seam, there was a Hutton seam, there was a Harvey seam, there was a yard seam, there was a five quarter seam, a modeling seam. Maintaining your body weight in 21 inches of height the same for seven hours, six, seven hours, shoveling and work, not just not just being in 21 inches, but working in 21 inches. Uh, we just work now with hoggers and t-shirt and a pair of Weltons and a pair of pit socks, because it was that hot. He was sweating all the time. My wife used to uh, wash me pit clothes, she'll tell you what they smelled like, just sweat. The high mean, which was not far from the surface, um, you had the lower mean, which was very deep. Then you had the uh, the plessy, which was another deep seam. And then you, uh, when you went the lakes of uh, under the sea, at the lakes of Elton Colliery, that you had the diamond seam and what they called the top cool. Because uh, at, at Ellington Colliery, the uh, the cool, the main seam was about fourteen foot thick, and he used to take the first eight eight to nine foot with a miner. Because it was board and pillar work, you couldn't do total extraction because you were close to the seabed. You could only do like uh, one third extraction. So it used to it used to drive like uh, roadways, and the roadways was probably what fourteen foot girders in and eight foot props, wooden props. And then after the miner had, they went in with a top cool and they drilled the top cool. They drilled the, the and shot the top cool down and filled it away with a. A joy uh, a MC3 loader. The miner working in Northumberland would probably be working in the same seam if it was the same thickness, because the seams vary as that as that grown over the millions of years, whatever that made with. And latterly, they finished off in what a kettle of brass steel was, uh, which was the deeper way out. That was more shallow work. But Leymouth and uh, Elton were both not, not when I first started, were both known for being, uh, if you like, shallow pits. And the seams were very close to the uh, seabed, so they had to do what you call board and pillar working, where you leave, uh, I think it's probably two thirds of the cool in, for it to help support the, the roof, which was completely different mine, and that was all done with the, uh, <coughs> that was all done the main seam. When I mentioned the four, but the, with the top curl flat, that was where the seams actually converged together. But within a, uh, so you'd, you'd probably have like, up to 14, 15 foot of cool, which we imagine that's a big seam. But at the time, they didn't have machines that could take uh, 40 or 50 foot over the time. Hence, uh, we're going to have two bites uh, at it. But there was just certain parts of the colliery where that occurred. Normally, in some places, the, there would be 50 or 60 foot gap between the, the yard seam and the, uh, the main seam. Then they will work with two different, uh, two different entities. But the, as the colliery, uh, the colliery life, life went on, went deeper and deeper, and that's when we went into the brass seal. Yeah, that's when the shearers and uh, the Langwell faces come in. When you shone your light at the coal, it used to gleam you know, the, in the low mean. Low mean coal was obviously the best. You know, the high mean, where I, where I worked at Merton, he used to, <laughs> in fact, I said to one of the lads once, I said, we buy this stuff. He used to shine your light out, it was just dull and just grey. The same was roughly about a yard and a, and, and a half. Uh, probably they went down uh, just below four foot. And then at the latter end of the cray, when I was left the pits, uh, they were getting further out underneath the North Sea and on the road to Germany, really. 
and the seams then were six, seven foot high. club trip was out, Fishburne was, was a ghost town when the club trip came. 21 buses went from here on the club trip. They hired buses from all over. Every, and they were right from the club right away, right away along here. Uh, 20, and they all got, kids got half a crown, it's, it's built up 10 bob. Uh. I had like kids' Christmas parties and that sort of stuff. It was me and who? No, no, that's how I finished. I think it's just... Uh, there's no social interaction, everybody tends to sit in the house and you get the GPF from Asda and uh, uh, but the MD is it I was just taking his red, he went to the club on a Friday or a Saturday or Sunday or whatever. I remember the way there was fishing competitions and all sorts, depending on, depending on what club you, you're a member of, because uh, well, you, basically you joined the same club as like, your, your dad. I'm still a member of the club now from when I was 18 and my dad had been a member of that uh, that club. Partly out of his life, but they were part of the community, and we, we were predominantly out of the miners was on the committee, and it was. But uh, well, then you've got to remember that uh, when we're going back to Washington, uh, where's the mining town? Every, everybody either walked at the pipe, or the mines, or somebody in that household well, was a miner or something. And the Corrie Rose was full of miners. No, no, it was just full of back the lets, and uh, obviously a lot of the a lot of the miners and their parents and whatnot passed down. No, they did old people's. Uh... Christmas dinners and that, and there was always it was the big place, and now it's just since the Pittsburgh's just gone down the bank. So I think the, the law of the country where you had to employ something like six percent of uh, disabled disabled people. Is, uh, oh, well, the the British girl is, that their percentage was something like sixteen percent or seventeen percent of the workforce was deemed as dis disabled. So the NCB used to get an awards every year of the uh, Disability Council for employing disabled people. What was never mentioned was that it was a colony that tended to disable these people uh, <laughs> in, the, in the first case, which I found quite ironic. Horny came at one, across one claustrophobic case uh, all the time I was underground and a, a man who uh, had worked underground for many years just froze and he wouldn't move. He was on a face and we had to drag him off. He couldn't move forwards or backwards. And a few days later, he was back at work. Why he had this sudden attack, he didn't know. The doctors didn't know. Vibration, my finger, and deaf in both ears. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis in every joint in my body. Uh, I've got a prosthetic elbow. Uh, I've got silicosis, I've got pneumoconiosis, I've got pleural plaques. Uh, 56 year old and pretty much most of that is down to working for the coal board and British Coal. A vibration white finger, you know, dust, uh, dust on the lungs, you know, uh, things like that, bad knees. I mean, there's a lot of mine has got bad knees. It was a common thing where were mine and bad knees, but like footballers, you know. <laughs> a dosco is basically a, a very large uh, road head machine, and it has uh, a hydraulic boom, a big, large hydraulic boom with a cutting head turret on the end, and basically that punches out in front of the machine and grinds away at the at the heading and just grinds the stone off and it, and it just creates plumes and plumes of dust and you'd have to just switch the machine off for a couple of minutes and just just simply so you could see what you were doing uh, so I'd switch the machine off for a couple of minutes let the dust clear and let's carry on cutting again but what you've got to appreciate is you're actually the extract system 
like an air extract system in a building, you're actually working and sitting in the extract system. It, it, that's the thing about mine and the air is just circulating it. So, you know, you're getting the dust from everybody else. You're generating dust for other people. You could see it in your lamps all the time. You know, it was, you were breathing it. When you used to cough when you got home, it used to bring, bring dust up. Black. I think pneumoconiosis, uh, dust was the worst thing that ever happened to any miners. And as a branchetary at the pit, I dealt with many cases of men who couldn't breathe, couldn't get a breath, couldn't walk, uh, debilitating diseases from the mining industry. And them men were never adequately compensated, in my opinion. Deafness, we were never told about uh, to wear ear muffs, you know, ear protectors. So you never wore them. Now firing down the roadway, like a roadway in front of you, a hundred shots at a time. It comes back to you, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. It's bound to, it's bound to affect your hearing. They closed the pit when they got into the 13 foot scene, which is actually economic madness as far as I'm concerned, but of course that was the politics of the day. The Iron Lady decided in her wisdom to close mines and import coal from places like Colombia, where they use child labour. If a child died, they just put another one in its place. There wasn't the safety there that there was in the British coal field. Uh, they also imported coal from Africa, where labour was cheap. But the coal that we got into the country wasn't up to the quality that we produced. And there are millions and millions of tons of coal sterilised below our feet. I've worked with and represented some of the greatest men who ever lived, I believe. Uh, nothing fears them, no matter what the task was, no matter what the job was, no matter what the conditions were. Miners always conditioned themselves to deal with every environment that they were in. If you want a group, a group of men who will overcome pretty much whatever nature throws at them and get a job done, then the miners were that group. Uh, it's such a waste, such a waste, waste, waste. What these are doing now, I mean, well, they, they're getting a the dual queue down, aye. Eh? What they're doing is they're making all these kids work part time or for nothing, you know, just just to keep the numbers down. I, I, I was earning three, 300 and odd pounds a week in 1991, 92, when the pitch shut. And some of these young ones now, they're not. Nothing like that. Now the pit's gone, grey stones flattened, shale and brick laid low. Where's all the shifts and footsteps to the pit? Love and hate, but it's walk we used to know. Playing in the village, terraces and rows, penkers, bits of stick were what toys. Doughty back lanes and scrambles doing the heap. Pit village, pit folk, pit boys. Cracked, aged faces, old wheezing lungs. Stories of places now dead. Tales of big hewers and ghosts in the seam. Aye, they lie on me heart like lead. Patterns in the dust, drawn with walking sticks. Of drifts and seams, aye, of sweated blood. Telling of the warren that's still doing below, of cables that paid bad and some paid good. Tell on, old man, as ye eke out your gills. Tell of the people who lived here. Tell of a live thing with a pulse and a heart, of the village and the life ye held dear. Tell of the knock on the door in the dark with his cap and his jacket in your hand. A big man it takes to break the sad news to a wife that the pits claimed a man. Would tell of the club with its golden rivers running, of the singing and the company and the cheer. Tell of the fun and the fights and the jokes. Tell of the miner and his beer. 
Stories of the crees and the whippets and the pigeons. Stove pipes draw happily away. Rough fingers touch green leaves and draw life from grey earth. Ay, <laughs> tales of giant leeks of other days. Tell on, old man, for your time isn't long. Nay pit to drain your spent old bones. But there's still fear hanging in the air all around, and the hand stretches out for our homes. For old man, old pit, old village must go, careless of heartbreak and strife. They're moving us on to strange places in a town. So sing loud, proud old man of your life. <laughs> 